And whenever you're ready to welcome everyone. Okay, welcome everyone. It's hard to believe it's Wednesday evening already. I had to think about that for a second. <laughs> Wednesday evening already. Um, we may as well go ahead and get started because it's 6.02. So the first thing we need to do is have a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Hopefully we can get through this pretty approve. quickly. Thank you, Dave. A second. I'd like to second. 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 Woo, everybody's on it tonight. Okay, uh, all in favor of tonight's agenda, raise your hand or do something so Julie knows we're approving. Great. Aye. And the next thing is Aye. to approve the minutes from the previous meeting, which was the January 13th meeting minutes. Does anybody have a motion to approve those minutes? I'll do the motion to approve. Thanks, Brian. A second? Second. Thanks, Ryan. Okay, all those in favor of approving the January 13th meeting minutes, raise your hand, say aye, or do something, type in the chat so Julie knows. Perfect. Aye. All right, so um, I don't know if you want to introduce Adam, Cindy, or you want me to. We are lucky to have a presentation tonight on the district's elementary proximity plan. But if Cindy has any other details that she wants to add before Adam gets started, I'll let her go ahead and do that. All right, thank you. Well, Adam Malloy is a relatively new member of our staff. He joined us this year, was a teacher uh, at North Fort Myers High School, taught both of my children at some point in the career along the way. So <laughs> a good guy, I can, I can give him props there. So I, his uh, focus is on community engagement with our communications department. And his work for the last couple of months has been all about uh, proximity plan. So tonight he's going to give us just a, a, an overview of where we stand in that plan right now, uh, knowing that this is just the beginning of the work and he is really looking for feedback on, uh, on, on the presentation, but also in terms of what is it that our community really wants from this proximity plan. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Adam Malloy. Thank you so much, Cindy, for uh, the very generous welcome. Uh, I did really enjoy teaching uh, your children. They were amazing kids. I'm sure you hear it all the time, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being such an amazing mom. Um, so yeah, my name is Adam Malloy, and I spent 12 years in the classroom uh, and also a, a large amount of my research time on student assignment plans. I'm really excited to be here with you guys uh, tonight. I hope you guys are as pumped about student assignment plans and structural and systemic change and uh, crazy uh, opposition yet, you know, just needing a little conversation uh, about the project. And, you know, I, I do apologize. I see some familiar faces on here, um, you know, that maybe have popped into a, a PTO or a SAC or a PTA meeting um, or another community. So I, I do apologize if, it, if it's at all repetitive. Uh, but currently we are in um, a feedback taking stage uh, for our draft plans uh, and we have processed I think every public input form that has come in with the technical working group making adjustments to maps and boundaries um, and I've also responded to every email or, or phone call that we've received about the project so it's really just about getting the information out there uh, having the community process it um, and you know and seeing uh, and seeing you know what are uh, kind of our our final boundaries as we move forward um, do I have the ability Cindy to share my screen cool and uh, I will do that right now so let me share my screen and boom share that with you guys fantastic uh, so this presentation has gone through a few iterations and we'll probably go through a few more as we build up uh, the policy companions to the new plan. Um, but this is, you guys are the, the first one uh, to see this version, which is, you know, similar to the, the earlier one. So just hopefully a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, so, you know, our, our big, our big push and slogan for this is equitable community choice for elementary schools in 2022, 2023. Uh, so not next school year. Uh, but the following school year for elementary schools and our big guiding questions and as a teacher uh, these were some things that you know we really tried to, to have the lesson uh, answer you know why do we need a new elementary school plan uh, what are some of our current issues uh, what are the benefits associated benefits of a new elementary school plan uh, 
in the in the direction and in the form that we're going and then how can the school district best collaborate with the community uh, prior to implementation um, you know, we, we actually this week just got into some pretty cool grassroots stuff on social media. I know Ms. Gittins is a social media star, but I was able to get uh, some, some student assignment stuff plugged in uh, to a lot of different mom groups across the social media platforms. And we, we saw an uptick uh, in responses to our website and email address uh, this week. So it was, it was really nice to see that uh, and hopefully, you know, connecting a little bit better uh, in the new age and in the new, in the new realm. So in terms of uh, why we need a new student assignment plan, uh, these are some current issues. Uh, I would call it, in general, a community disconnect in transportation. Uh, you currently uh, are able to select schools uh, in the subzone, and I'll, I'll show you those, those maps here in just a second, but in the subzone that you live in, in, in the adjacent subzone. Uh, on, our, on the worst case, in East Zone, Subzone 2, uh, you are able, or well, you have to rank 16 different elementary schools. Uh, that is uh, a little bit excessive, uh, I think, in terms of the research. Uh, and what I have for you here are just uh, some maps and some transportation routes to really highlight the community disconnect and transportation issue. All of the uh, little aquamarine dots uh, on the left map go to, go to Allen Park Elementary. Um, you can see that they're bypassing a large number of schools. Um, and in terms of uh, perception, uh, our current system has created, uh, I think, some issues as it relates to overselection and uh, perceived quality of certain schools over others. And that's not really our job, uh, and that's not what any student assignment plan or district should really be about. Uh, it should be about consistency, you know, consistency in terms of school quality, performance, and professional expectations. Um, now, on the right side, you have a very interesting bus route, and you know there's there's plenty of examples to choose from. I, I selected these just because I'd use them in you know in some of my you know in some of my other you know research or side projects. But uh, these are there's three elementary school students that are picked up uh, at 5:40 a.m. at Reflection Isles, uh, and if you're familiar with where that is, you know that you are going to be traveling pretty far to get to Edison Park. I did want to highlight that these children. Um, are going to travel about 105 minutes uh, to get to their destination, uh, about 50 miles to uh, and from their school uh, at Edison Park, uh, and also bypassing eight closer elementary schools. Uh, so in terms of community disconnect, we know that there's a lot of research behind community connection to schools, and really this project is about creating stronger community choice, um, and then also some of the associated savings, not just money, but also hours on the bus and what that could be used for. Um, another issue that our current plan has produced uh, has to do with uh, the history of our county, the promise of the Blaylock case and equity. Uh, so for about 35 years, the county was under a federal desegregation order as a result of the Blaylock case. I like to think of the Blaylock case like Brown versus Board, but for Lee County. Uh, and that was uh, filed in 64 uh, with the first year of integration, uh, which was very small scale at 65, 66. Uh, from there, for the, for the next 35 years, uh, every student assignment plan had to be approved with the primary goal of, uh, you know, meeting uh, racial, uh, you know, racial balances in schools. And those attendance zones changed constantly. Uh, kids were moved from one school to the next. Uh, they were bused extensively to try to achieve this. Eventually, in 1999, the county is granted unitary status, uh, meaning that they had fulfilled the requirements, they settled with the plaintiffs, and that, that's where we really see the origins of our current student assignment plan. Uh, now, in terms of uh, you know, what I see as, uh, as, a, as an issue and what we're really trying to tackle is you know, just some of the, the increased student isolation or what you know, we might consider resegregation trends. Uh, we have seen uh, you know, in the past 20 years uh, some isolation and some, I would say, uh, products of the unregulated choice market in, in these large subzones. You could call it uneven student distribution. Uh, you can call it resegregation. It just depends on you know, what, what group you're talking to. Uh, you know, in, in, in 2018, 2019, we had five, uh, what's, what research would classify as intensely segregated elementary schools. Those are listed there. And then uh, we also had four, what I would consider to be at risk, intensely segregated elementary schools. And if you go back and study the past 20 years demographics, uh, those, these schools kind of uh, go back and forth around that 90% uh, non-white mark. Uh, that doesn't match the changing demographics. 
Um, and it just matches and, and shows us that we uh, we could do a little bit better job in terms of evenness and student dis distribution. And I think in the new plan, uh, we'll be able to have a, a much better grasp on that. Uh, and certainly we should. Now our new plan, uh, here's kind of the, the purpose of it uh, and some of the, the major pieces. Uh, so the, the purpose of this new student assignment plan is to offer stronger community choices for our students, really connecting uh, you know, our, our neighborhoods with stronger choices, and then also prioritizing the equity uh, piece, uh, creating smaller zones that strengthen diversity, build community schools, improve transportation, and maintain choice. On average, our zones have uh, three to four choices, um, and compare that to the 16 uh, in East Zone, Subzone 2, uh, or, you know, the 12 uh, that, you know, South Zone, Subzone uh, 1 or 2 has. Uh, and so I think that that's going to be a vast improvement on our current system. I want to take a look, you know, the current map uh, with all the different subzones is on the left. And then the new plan, this is draft plan four, uh, but there are, are, there are four draft plans available for comment. Uh, you can see on the right. Uh, so really just becoming a little bit more strategic. Uh, and I think, you know, it's important to probably asking yourself, you know, well, how did this happen? Or how did you, how did you go through this process? And it actually was a fairly... Uh, I would say strategic and technological process, uh, you know, for developing uh, these new draft plans. And, you know, that's with Davis Demographics, our consultant group, uh, really using data-driven decision-making and geographic information software, community, residential, student data. Uh, we're able to look at each one of the draft plans and say, okay, in this pool, what do our, what do our, what do our students look like? All right, and if distributed properly, you know, could we have uh, could we have equity and diversity at each school? And I think that that's something that's 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 a really great piece. It's a skill set that I think was needed in terms of pushing us, uh, you know, and making this a sustainable project. Um, you know, and the process is still in the works, so we're still developing and making more sophisticated and complex. Uh, you know, the policy and programs that will be associated with this. So uh, a lot of the feedback uh, that we get about the project right now is what about my current assignment you know what does that mean if i'm now living in a new zone and so our teams our leadership is working on that and you know we have some drafts and we have some loose cost associations with the different plans and hopefully working with the governance team uh, the chief's cabinet um the hierarchical structure there and then in conjunction with the board uh, you know, making sure that we make the right policy, uh, the, the right accompanying policies with this new plan. Our project timeline is right now we have uh, four draft plans available for review. Uh, we're taking any and all public feedback. We are triaging uh, comments and making phone calls, uh, finding people even if they don't leave their, their phone number to make sure that they uh, they have a connection. I think last night I was responding to about four around 9 p.m. and I was like, hey, you know, I know this is kind of technical. Please just give me a call. You know, call my cell phone. It's listed below. Um, and, you know, I mentioned some of that draft, uh, some of the, the grassroots stuff on social media. That's what you know, we're in a new age. Um, and, you know, going out there on John Miller's MySpace is perhaps maybe the way to go uh, to get more feedback and get more connection uh, with the community. Uh, but, you know, all of this work in all of our, you know, all of our really, you know, knocking on doors uh, is to get people, you know, connected with the plan because uh, this has to be done together. You know, and I think, you know, using our, our, his, our history as a guide and realizing that the school district and the community uh, really have to come together uh, in this process. And I think that we're starting to see some of the fruits of that uh, as we move forward. Um, and I'm not a, you know, I'm not a stranger uh, to uncomfortable conversations about what makes a nice or a good school in our current system. Um, and I've had, been having a lot of those conversations over the past few months. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about the project, as you can tell. Uh, I recognize this as one of the systems that could really take the Lee County School District into the next uh, into the next level uh, as a progressive uh, school district. And I'm excited about the opportunity to, to be a part of that team. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're going for July 2021 with the final boundary plan and policies presented to the school board. Uh, and then the following school year, so not that school year of 21-22, but 22-23, uh, implementing uh, the new student assignment plan for elementary schools. So Emmett Smith, uh, famous number 22, Michael Jordan, famous number 23, uh, if you're a big sports fan there. Now, in terms of the associated improvements, you're probably like, there are a lot, 
right? It's a better system for our community and future. Uh, there's a connection between uh, communities, uh, parents and their schools, which we know shows great growth in terms of student academic uh, increases and also in terms of school performance. Uh, strengthening the, the diversity and really hitting that equity piece uh, in these new zones and then the associated funding uh, and how that could be put back right to the engine of what we're trying to do. And that's, uh, you know, getting that funding back to the school sites uh, with transportation savings. Um, and what that can be used for uh, is really, you know, is really, I think, just uh, a huge positive uh, for our school district. You know, we want your feedback and that's where we that's where we're currently uh, you can visit the website you know leeschools.net slash proximity plan uh, they have the interactive web web map, web app there uh, the draft maps the public uh, feedback form and then all questions comments meeting requests they go right to me uh, proximity plan at leeschools.net and i will uh, and have responded uh, to all of them uh, so that's really the phase that we're at now um, you know, making the adjustments to the maps based on public input and then at the district side, uh, really starting to research and, and compile the teams for the policy and implementation. Um, so uh, without further uh, ado, I leave it to the experts in the field, uh, our team here that's gathered, and uh, I'm excited to, to hear your guys' comments and to, uh, you know, to, to just try to answer and have a conversation about this very important project. One of the superintendents, Big Five, uh, I would say, you know, past overdue uh, with some of the issues that our current system has um, and really, I think, breaking us free uh, from some of the, you know, from some of the previous plans that were really tied uh, to a, you know, to a one way tunnel vision thinking of how to deal with this issue uh, of our of our past. So I'm excited and thank you. I'm, I'll probably stop talking and mute myself. And I'm sorry that my first letter and my first name is lowercase. Uh, that is not any particular protest against the capitalization of my first letter. It just comes up like that every time on, on Zoom. Thank you, Adam. So we'll start with um, any questions that you have for Adam. And then once we get those questions answered, we'll move on to if the committee has any recommendations that they would like to provide to Adam and to the board. So we'll start with any questions that you have. I have a question. Dr. Stewart. How are you, Adam? Good, it's good to see you. You too. Um, I just, I'm a little unclear about um, the, what makes this plan equitable? I guess I just need clarity on that. So the equity, the equity piece of the, of the plan? Yeah, yeah, because it came up a lot in the presentation, but I, I just need clarity, I think, on, on how that happens. Yeah, so in our current plan, we have uh, goals uh, for student demographics, um, you know, uh, race, ethnicity being a, a big part, but socioeconomic, uh, English language learners, exceptional student education, uh, and really having a better grasp on the distribution uh, of those in the new student pools. Uh, that makes it more equitable. I think what, we're, what we really want to try to avoid is any sort of further isolation and actually address those schools that have become more isolated by, dem by, by student demographic. Um, so when, I, when we talk about at risk, uh, intensely segregated or intensely segregated, our district uh, will, you know, will pr prioritize in the new plan, making sure that that doesn't happen in the choice lottery. Okay, so that, yeah. I guess that brings me to my next question is, can you tell me a little bit about the choice lottery? Uh, you know, you know, right now, I don't really have anything to present besides that the team is working really hard around the clock on that, uh, on whatever preferences might move into the new plan because currently we do have a controlled choice plan and it's weighted by proximity one two miles proximity two five miles proximity three ten miles and sibling and capacity uh, but what if we actually thought a little bit beyond those preferences where we could make something uh, or, where we could also make something to adhere to our current plan goals and those those plan goals have been in our current plan or in our student assignment plan uh, for the past 15 to 20 years so uh, we're really hoping to get back to those goals because we know what it means for student achievement but yeah the, you know our leadership teams are working on them now uh, we don't have anything finite or concrete as it relates to those preferences, uh, but those are a major priority. So I do appreciate the equity how, uh, because you get a lot of eye flutters when you're talking about the equity how without actually delivering on the mechanism that's gonna ensure that and make that happen. But yeah, I'm not just a used car student assignment salesman. Uh, I've been studying. I've been studying this for the past eight years. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I leave, I, I live, uh, eat and sleep 
uh, student assignment plan. So we can do it and there are a number of ways that we can do it. Uh, school programming, school funding, school resourcing, school staffing uh, all have to be considered and looked at. Um, and you know, what's, what's really hard, uh, Dr. Stork, in, in looking at this is that our, you know, for 15 years, you know, we have been in this system uh, in which we've pitted school against school, program against program in a very competitive uh, manner, which is great, I think, in MMA and football, but it's not great when we're dealing with kids. Uh, and I think that that's a, you know, that's something in a lot. Of, I'm not trying to just glance over. I was at a, I was at an arts and an ACE Cambridge school, which is a dual magnet, which could ba basically monopolize all students, uh, you know, in the West Zone and did so at the expense of others. And I think that this this plan for elementary schools has a, has the potential uh, with the right mechanisms and policies uh, to combat some of that, to combat the perception, to combat the uh, uh, the, com the competitive nature. Now, there'll still be choice, uh, but we want them to be consistent choices in each of the new zones. Okay, thanks. Adam? Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. My name is Dennis. I think your presentation was very good. You touched on a lot of different uh, aspects of the who, the what, the why, you know, and the how. Um, let me ask you on, on a little bit of history. You had shown those schools that were marked with aquamarine. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the school that those students went to? Allen Park. Allen Park. But they came from a larger area, and and then uh, and then people get bust. I know people like the bus thing there. Are are individual schools rated? Like, do they get an A, B, C, D type rating? And is that why people want to go to those schools? They have more history, or is it better sports? Or uh, so at the elementary school level, Mr. Ryan knows you know no sports, but there is a, a school rating and performance. Uh, there uh, you're dealing with a lot of perceptions. There's actually been a decent amount of research work on the public's theory uh, about how parents talking about certain schools creates a perception of teacher quality and admin quality. Um, and in a choice model without any sort of regulation, but for proximity uh, or sibling, uh, you can you can get some runaway runaway perceptions that aren't actually connected with the reality. And I think one of the Great, greatest parts about this new job is I've been able to get out to a lot of different schools and at the elementary school level uh, they are rocking it across all regions and sub zones and parents have just you know it's just maybe not a, a conversation topic but um, yeah I think I, I think the new plan really has the ability to remake uh, the, the, the perceptions of, of schools uh, in these newer tighter zones strategic zones uh, and I think that we'll see I think that we'll see a lot of benefit uh, from you know from this uh, going from large to very to very small um, as it relates to, to to parent perception. But you're right, and there has been a lot of work done about why parents choose certain schools. Uh, it doesn't always match up, and it it sometimes uh, can mask uh, can mask maybe maybe some you know some some issues that are a little bit difficult to deal with. Uh, you know, I'll just give for example. You know, I get a lot of emails about you know student populations um, and why they don't want their kid to go with a certain student population. Well, it, it really, what they're saying is kind of just coded language uh, for issues of race and class. And you know, that's that's not really something. I mean, we should be in the business of really tackling that head on, regardless of how uh, challenging those conversations are. So. Yeah, yeah to, you know, to your point about the, the perception of schools that, you know, that's absolutely right. You know, we have created a market in which there is a perception uh, of certain schools. Well, if you have stronger communities and stronger schools, you have a better city and, and that's, you know, educating our students and from, from the community and for the community. Thank you. Adam, um, just to clarify, Adam, was it Allen Park or Edison Park? Because I heard both in the presentation. Yeah, so the uh, the map of where the students lived in that little aquamarine map, uh, that was Allen Park. Uh, now in the transportation, that was going to Edison Park. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. what I wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, can I make a comment on that last question? There's another um, possible reason for parents choosing as well. And a lot of that depends on the socioeconomics, et cetera. Because if you have working parents that cannot afford after school care, they will very often uh, apply for a school that's close to where they work. Because then they can drop the students off and pick them up, not have to worry about, 
you know, I get off at five and I can't get back across town. So that depending on the area and the socioeconomics and the demographics, there are various reasons why. Um, I know in, the, in, in a lot of the minority groups, if uh, mother works or mother and father works, then they may put the child where grandma can pick them up. And so, and grandma lives over here. So they will request that. Then they don't have to worry about after school or before school or paying for that, that they can't afford. So, you know, besides the academic side, when you take it down to other uh, demographics in the district, there's other rationale as well. And I know I've, and Adam knows I've gotten that question a lot about how do we make sure if a certain area in a certain zone has a plethora of level ones or the where there's level one, two, three, four, five, how then do we make that equitable? And then you're going to tell parents you have to go to this school. And just like you mentioned, uh, some will say, well, I don't want my child to go here. And the, the ultimate goal, I was talking with um, uh, Clayton Simmons this week, who is the director of high schools. And I know this isn't high school, but he was talking about our overall goal in the district is to one day have schools that are equaled out with level ones and twos and threes and fours so that everybody learns from everybody and no one has the lion's share of trying to bring those babies up from the bottom. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Hey, this is Brian Rasnick. Uh, more of a comment than a question. Um, number one, uh, hallelujah. It, it, it's, it's really about time and, and I, I'm, I'm so happy to be part of this. And uh, I, I think the district is making a major improvement here. Uh, just a quick story. Uh, when we first moved down here from Chicago in 1997, we had a, a baby in 2003 and obviously was going to be attending an elementary school. And when we got our 13th choice, we were assigned our 13th choice, which we lived in Southern Estero, and that 13th choice was up on Colonial. Uh, my wife told me that she really didn't care. Um, she was moving back to Chicago. Uh, and, and that created obviously quite a bit of angst and it's the number one discussion within uh, moms and dads for the three months or four months before these kids go to school and it creates a lot of discussion in families and, and I think that uh, this should help get rid of some of that angst and that nervousness and, uh, and I'm all for community schools. Uh, in, in our particular neighborhood we have 435 residents. And the last I had heard, we had 15 different elementary schools between charter and elementary schools in our neighborhood. Um, and, and I think you lose out on, on some friendships that, that we all had growing up when we were going to neighborhood schools. So again, kudos, and I, I'd, I'd be willing to participate or, or do more for, do whatever you need to help you guys out. I had a couple uh, questions. Can you hear me? Um, one is how transparent is this lottery going to be? Um, because the current lottery, as far as I know, or anyone else I've ever talked to that's gone through it and not got their choice and then magically got it or their neighbor got it and they didn't, um, it, will this actually be transparent or in a black box? Uh, yeah, Ryan, it's, I mean, it, from my perspective, it has to be transparent. Um, even if it's, even if it's challenging, uh, you know, I, it, it, the whole process has to be transparent, you know, it, it just, it, it does. So, you know, as soon as we get these policies and as soon as we accompany them with the, uh, the new plan, it would make everybody's job easy, community and district together to, to have it all out there. And what is it, what does it mean? Um, you know, our, the current lottery system, if you, I mean, you could spend two weeks just reading the waiver system. I mean, there's literally like eight different waivers uh, for trying to get into another school. Um, you know, there I, I I have a copy of the student the student enrollment plan called the plan in quotes, um, and perhaps it's in quotes because nobody actually knows exactly what's in it. 
Uh, but yeah, I have, I have read it numerous times and it's extremely complex. And uh, I have begun to draft rewrites for every section that will change with the elementary school, uh, with the new proximity plan, uh, but it has to be straightforward. Uh, and, you know, the lottery of what, what allows one student to get in. Uh, I do see the P1, the two mile walk radius, uh, you know, uh, getting, you know, getting carried over the sibling, getting carried over, that makes sense. Uh, but we might have to adjust P2. Um, and that's something that the teams are going to have to look at because in some of these zones, you don't even have really like a five mile. And then what does that do for the lottery of choice? If you're just going to grant to the entire zone, some sort of, you know, proximity preference. So yeah, P2, P3 can be struck in a lot of these new zones. And then maybe you actually have a real lottery, you know, and I think the way that the lottery was originated, uh, to voluntarily choose, uh, to go to certain schools has been, you know, has been a little bit disconnected. Uh, in our in, our, in the current system, so you know, I, I really hope I really hope uh, Ryan to get it as transparent as possible. Um, you know, I've already started to to walk through kind of like the different ways to to explain it with uh, hypotheticals and little animated school kids that you know that get uh, a certain golden ticket uh, depending on you know what preferences they have and what that means. And, you know, it can get a little bit complex, but with the smaller zones and smaller schools, it's, a, it, it, to me, it's, a, to me, it's a lot easier. Uh, and I've tried to, and I've tried to, you know, hypothetically create uh, mechanisms in our current zones. And there's, it's way too many kids and way too many preferences. So um, yeah, it's gotta be as transparent as possible. Uh, that's not just lip service. Um, I will, uh, I'll, I'll try to, we'll try to get it as straightforward as we can and then out to the community. And can and I add a good point, Ryan? Can in I terms add to of, Yes, go right ahead. No, finish. Go ahead. I was with the proximity. I know with all these new communities being built, especially kind of the southern part of the county. Uh, to give an idea, like for me to get to the gate of my community is two and a half miles. So if you put a school there, I'm not guaranteed a school basically inside my community. So when you're looking at, is it where the bus stop is? Is it where the, the start of the community is? Because um, I know there's a lot of really large tracts of land that are now starting to be developed. Um, so that to me was you know kind of fun. I'm, I'm in Bella Terra and I think there's four or five elementary school buses, um, but you could actually put an elementary school across the street and it would be a lottery to see if the kids would get in. Yeah, that, those are, are great questions. And there is a, um, a committee that's going to be put together to look at policies, including, you know, those, the grandfathering, you know, how will we work around grandfathering for students that are in the current schools? And what will be the, the proximities? And, and getting those policies very clear so that everyone understands what they are, because right now it can be very confusing. And Ms. Gittins, I believe you wanted to add to that. Yes, based on, you know, Ryan's question about transparency and all, if you watch our last couple of meetings, one of the main topics was the inclusion of stakeholders. And it's something that's very uh, important to me to make sure that we do. And I, I even said yesterday, I applaud the district on the way that they're rolling out proximity because it's not in stone yet. And we're having these conversations. So I anticipate that as they add other layers, it will go back out to the community. What we need is not to have a situation. And as I call it, we had a meeting and no one came. So it's a matter of spreading the word and saying, um, you know, make your, your comments known. And we hope that at each juncture, when the policies are done, then it's open for the community to say, uh, this policy looks okay, but what about this? And then when we get to the next level of changing this or that, and to me, that is how we can best serve all stakeholders as we are planning and moving forward. Because then when we get to the end, to the finished product, then everyone has been involved, everyone has heard, and everyone's happy with the outcome rather than, you know, oh, why did you do this and that? If we do it together, step by step along the way, everyone gets their voices heard. I one more uh, follow up on, on that. Cindy, you're trying to, you're sitting here on mute. 
Yeah, I was going to say, you can go ahead and, and finish up your questions, and then uh, Warren and Amanda are the next two with their hands up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so last question for me. Um, with this new proximity plan, I assume this is going to obviously save on miles, maybe cut down the number of buses. Is that going to impact jobs for uh, transportation workers? I guess if we're including all stakeholders, I mean, uh, that's that's a job I would not want uh, ever. I have enough problem with two kids in the car, never mind all the kids in the car. But I guess have they been engaged in this and is that going to be any sort of issue with uh, with that labor group? Yeah, so Roger Lloyd has been, um, he's been a, a stakeholder, a district stakeholder at all of our meetings, uh, you know, going through the process. And, you know, that's definitely, uh, I think it could really assist with some of the, um, with some of the issues that they have uh, in terms of staffing and, and subbing and that sort of thing. Um, but no, I mean, the, it's, uh, it will allow, I think, for an expansion of conversation uh, where the district is not being, you know, in it, where it's not really being strangled by by routes uh, and by timings and by levels uh, as to the buses, you know, because our school start times are really held hostage by the bus routes. Uh, it could maybe be a little bit more creative and not to mention, um, you know, not to be too creative. Crazy. It is coming from someone very low on the totem pole, but we could also talk about, you know, maybe more shared style of uh, uh, transportation uh, between Lee County and the school district. So that, you know, the possibilities are there, but no, Mr. Lloyd, to answer your question has been, has been involved and there has not been a concern as it relates to employment. There's only been an acceptance that this could really have some positive impacts for his team. Thank you. And Mr. Lloyd is the director of transportation. Ryan, did you have any more questions? Okay, thank you. Warren, I believe you were next. Actually, I think Amanda was first, if you want to do that. Uh -oh. Sorry, I didn't see who went up first. So Amanda, if you want to go and then we'll come back to Warren. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Um, I have, uh, this is probably one area where I feel pretty passionate about it only because, um, you know, having three kids in the system and, and really as a parent choosing, you know, um, where my child goes to school. So I'm, my elementary son, my son, who's in elementary school is, is pretty much in the community school. We live right in the he goes to Pine Woods. It's right down the road. You know, it's got that community school environment. But what I, I get concerned about when we, we, we hear, okay, we're going to remap it because we have people driving. I mean, people are, want, are going, want to go to Allen Park for a reason. And to your point, you mentioned, uh, Adam, that it created this um, perception amongst parents that some schools are better than others. That's what 15 years or how many years that, we've, that was mentioned has done to this, the way we, we with the student assignment and the way it's been done. So we're, you're, the team is going to have to figure out a way to almost undo some of that perception. And, you know, it's a, it's a change. It's a major change for people. And it, again, for pe parents that are new to the district, it won't necessarily be uh, as, as um, impactful. But for those that have their kids in the system now, you're, you're going to have, you know, even at the elementary level, kids understanding why, you know, why are we going, why can't I choose it, even though you know, it's this many miles away because maybe they, they've had their kids are already at Allen Park and, you know, they're going to, they want their other two youngest kids to go to Allen Park, even though it's 15 miles away. I personally drive my oldest child to high school 20 miles every day because that's where she wanted to go. And I, because the South Zone is so big. Um, but I'm just saying that you're, the team is going to be up against that. It's not just a geographic thing or a transportation thing. It's really considering school performance and, um, you know, making sure you can identify that per perception of, of school, one school being better than the other. I mean, that's going to be something we, we need to consider when rolling this out. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic point. Um, yeah, you're dealing with a huge mountain there. Uh, something that, you know, we, all we can see is the current system uh, and how do we see beyond that? Um, you know, and even talking, you know, even talking to some principals, you know, they're very proud of how they have, uh, you know, how they have created their, their programs and their draw, uh, and their pipeline from, you know, all across the sub zone. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's a challenge. So it's, uh, it's something I think the team is, is, is up for, 
Um, and yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, people have, have very vested, uh, you know, their heart is very vested in, in their choice uh, and maintaining that choice. There becomes a very defense, you know, a defense mechanism. And we understand that and we hear that. Uh, and we're, you know, we are trying to create a system that, you know, in a, in a few years um, from, from implementation, uh, we'll be, we'll be dismantling uh, some of the, the perceptions that cost us. Uh, you know, if we really want to become, you know, one of those top districts, uh, we know what we have to do and we know what we have to have uh, in our schools. Uh, it's just getting there. That's the hard part. And so, yeah, to your point, I, I completely agree. Yeah. And just remembering this term, and I'll just leave it at comment because I know Warren had a comment, but it, it, it's the perception, whether it's real to the, the administration or not, that the perception amongst parents of that is that all schools are not created equal. And that's something you're going to, again, so you said that mountain, you're going to have to be up against that. It, it, we have to shift that if this is going to work for that, you know, for this new assignment planning. So it's, it's a lot to un unravel and undo is my point. Yeah, man, we were just working on a promotional video today where we were talking about consistent, um, you know, what, you know, kind of breaking down the myths about our elementary schools. You know, some schools have special program. Well, no, all elementary schools have the same curriculum. You know, uh, well, you know, some schools, you know, use this or use that. No, no, no. It's all at the disposal uh, for all elementary schools, you know, or this school has this. Pro no, 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 no. There's no admission criteria. It's all school wide. You know, it, it's it's breaking down some of those myths. So we are working on the informational and the communication piece. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's I, I think that you are going to have some some rough areas. I'm not you know, I'm not blinded. I'm not blinded by that, but I'm not trying to uh, I'm not trying to just create a, 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 we're not trying to just create a system or something that can, you know, that can appease one or two. Uh, we're trying to create a better system for the future for our schools. So uh, we're ready. I think we're ready for that. Thank you, Warren. Yeah, uh, I guess a couple of questions slash comments about the whole process, maybe get a little bit of understanding. Um, I really appreciate all the work that's been going into this. I mean, I think you, you've touched on so many different issues, but um, what I had a question about mainly was how have you factored in for the growth? I mean, cause Lee County is growing so fast and I know you don't want to do this again in five or 10 years or, or maybe 10, but not five for sure. Um, and, and then um, the second question I had, I'll let you answer them both later, was basically um, this is great for people that are, going into kindergarten and are picking this but what about the folks that move into the area and their kids come into second grade I, I work a lot with you know with people that are moving here um, for a job or something like that and trying to explain the student assignment process or this choice assignment to them you know throws them for a loop they're used to community schools where they come from that type of thing this at least gets it closer to that and easier to explain and I really appreciate you simplifying the plan, whatever that is that you're you're editing out and, and everything. So those are kind of the comments slash questions I, I thought I'd bring up maybe for you to talk about a little bit if you could. Yeah, thank you. That the first one about the forecasting is, you know, that that's really where that consultant group Davis Demographics came in. That's that's kind of their skill set, their forte. Uh, they examined all of our growth patterns. They have a, a proprietary formula uh, that considers generation rate and then also matching with all the new construction and new growth and then what that means for the student populations. Uh, so their their capacity projections are at 10 years. But, you know, in Lee County in Southwest Florida, you know, that could swing it. That could swing and change pretty quickly. Um, I think the ultimate goal is that we, re we do revisit uh, the zones, but only with small minor changes based on the 10 year forecast, you know, so their, uh, their 10 year forecast for population and capacity, um, you know, they're, they are extremely confident in its accuracy. And in fact, they just made an adjustment based on COVID data uh, that they had been working with on the national, regional and state level uh, to, to, to some of the zones so that they were able to make those adjustments on the fly uh, and include that in their formula for their forecasting. You know, I, I would say that their, you know, their skill set 
uh, similar to you know Captain America and the Shield, uh, Davis demographics and population forecasting. Uh, that's their that's their jam right there. So I, I am confident in that. I've been extremely impressed with their ability to try to try to create something that's sustainable. You know, in the '90s when they were moving boundaries every single year uh, and kids were getting pulled and then moved and then pulled and then moved and then bust and then pulled and then moved. Um, you know, just I mean, imagine that context and, and how how strong the board uh, in the district had to be to withstand, you know, that level of, of pressure and, and opposition. Uh, we're trying to create something much more sustainable, I think, for the 10 year uh, for the 10 year mark. But we take a look at that growth and we say or we take a look at the slow or the increase and say, OK, well, we may need a new we need a new school in this zone or we, need, we have to we have to move the boundaries a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, we're hoping to create something that's that's pretty sustainable. Now, I do. From my position, I like the phased approach uh, to kindergarten, but what it throws off is the entire capacity uh, that we worked with in the new zone. Uh, but I, I do the fa the phased approach that you brought up. I you know I, I was like that's that could be the the easiest the path of least resistance uh, for for the implementation if you just take kindergarten then kindergarten first. Uh, but what you know my history of uh, or my understanding of uh, those sorts of, of phases. Um, is it's it, it, it sometimes can lead to a failure to implement properly. So um, yeah, I think that we have a certain approach, and you know, conversations uh, like this are very extremely important uh, to understand that this is you know that this is something that you know potentially could be an issue for us um, you know as a, as a school district. But uh, but no, I do I, I I you know when I was thinking about this, well, how could it most easily be done? You would think okay, just just kindergarten. Um, but it did, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty complicated after that. Yeah. Only so much of that growth is going to be from people. There a lot of people coming in from outside. It's not going to be, uh, organic growth necessarily. So yeah. Thanks. I, I have one more thing, Cindy. <laughs> yes. And go ahead. It looks like John, and then John. And raised too. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say, I do think, you know, as far as the transportation savings, if, you know, if we could see some of that money going towards instructional or student related um, expenses, I would love to see that. I know that that's those are two different budgets, but still, um, <laughs> you know, I, I would like to see that. And obviously there's a ton of evidence out there on the benefits of neighborhood schools and building community with schools. So, you know, the benefits are there. I, I do think though that right now that the, the district does not have the culture of neighborhood schools. If you're my age, you grew up with neighborhood schools and so you're used to that. But a lot of parents and Amanda just kind of shared her sentiments that a lot of parents have, which is the culture has not been neighborhood schools. So promoting that I think is gonna be really important. And the other comment I wanted to make because you were talking about that you're in the feedback taking stage of this plan and you trying to get information out there and I support and really appreciate that you're taking to social media um, to reach some of those groups. But um, I shared with this with Mrs. Gittins at the la and others at the last meeting. Um, the majority of my students are K-12 teachers and many of them are parents. Um, and I, I just did an anecdotal sort of uh, questionnaire of people to, to say to them, what do you know about Lee County's proximity plan? And um, many people that I talked to didn't understand what a proximity plan was or why it would be important to them. So I think that that's some messaging that you may want to consider as you're trying to get the word out there is why let people know why this is important to them because the words proximity plan don't mean a lot to some people. They just don't understand what that is and why it would be important to them. So my suggestion would be that we start to use language of this is important to you because um, not this is our new proximity plan, come learn about it. Um, because a lot of people just don't understand what that is. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Stork. That's a, a fairly consistent critique that uh, that, we, that, the, that we've received, um, you know, about the messaging and communication. So, you know, hopefully we'll eventually get to the spot where it's just a, it's a, this new student assignment plan is important because we love community and we love schools. The last thing I wanted to say is, you know, 
but you have all my best wishes. I actually worked at a public K-12 school district when they did something very much like this and the school board meetings were wild. So um, as much pre-planning as they did, uh, when it came time to actually implement the plan, the school board meetings were something to behold. So you have all my best wishes as you go forward with this plan. But see, that's Thanks. I have to say in there, that's why we're trying to involve the community early on at every step, because then we don't have the the last minute, we're still gonna have the last minute looky loose that didn't know, but it, the more we can get to, to kind of come along and understand in a basic way, the easier it's going to be. Thank you, John and then Dave. Thanks, Cindy. Adam, I appreciate the presentation, extremely informative. A um, Couple quick questions, and, and I may have missed this in your presentation, but is there a, a, a target goal for the reduction in the number of choices uh, with the new zones? So uh, fantastic question. So um, three to four choices on average, but some, some zones because of the school density, like how close they are built together, uh, we did have some zones that were, that were challenging uh, to really get down. I really thought three to four, uh, two to three would be, would, would be ideal. And uh, the team really tried to work with those. If you look at Cape Coral and Lehigh, uh, they, on average, because of their distance and perhaps planning of where these schools, where these schools are, uh, they, um, you know, they, I think they are right around that three choice mark in almost every zone, uh, depending on when a new school is coming on board uh, out in the east. But in Fort Myers, that central Fort Myers area is so dense. We tried a, a number of ways to try to uh, to try to get the three to four choices, but then we were off on the diversity. We were off on the student pools, uh, and so that's why H in Plan Four actually has eight choices. Uh, so it's one of it's it's one of the only like zones that seems like a carryover, uh, even though it does. I think it does some things strategically, like it brings in. Um, it brings in uh, Edgewood and James Stevens into the Fort Myers area away from Lehigh, uh, which, you know, which it, it, you know, it had been in the East Zone. Um, but yeah, the, the target goal, I think, if you look at the map, you'll see that it was kind of in that, that three range. Uh, but because of the density um, and the, the, the student density, we had, to, we had to break from that a little bit. And, you know, we're still changing them. Uh, we're still looking at, we have had a lot of feedback on the Zone P and Plan 4. And a lot of people uh, not happy with where the boundaries are. So we're we keep processing and taking a look at that, running all the displacement numbers, and then taking a look at where their current population is living, and then how can we we address some of that? Uh, but yeah, that's I, I would say that three to four was the initial goal, and that was that was for no no other reason but trying to get that community that community choice feel. Um, but yeah, there, you, you'll notice that 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 H kind of gets away from that. So that's a great question. Appreciate it. I, two more quick ones if you got time. Um, first is, have y'all done an evaluation as to the estimated transportation cost savings? So we have, uh, we have inquired and hopefully we should have some, some dollar figures to present. Um, you know, we, we know that transporting, and this was, I think, and I'm not sure if they lag behind on the date, but uh, 2018, uh, the cost to transport a, a, a student on average in Lee County was around $1,000. Uh, $1, um, and so we're trying to break that down and, and work with transportation to see how we can run different models for the dollar figure. Uh, but that, I think that would really help our, our messaging too, because then you can see that dollar amount go right back into the general school. Uh, and like Dr. Stork mentioned, they are in two different funding pots, but it doesn't mean that the school can't be improved with the dollars. All right. And then last question um, for those of us who are not lucky enough to get a, you know, kind of personal presentation like this. I know I have friends and, and colleagues who are going to have questions on this. But short of giving them your personal cell phone number, what's the best resource to send them to to find out information about the proximity plan so that they can educate themselves? So the website, uh, which is leeschools.net forward slash uh, proximity plan that has all of the information on there and then the email address uh, for questions comments uh, meeting requests it doesn't matter how big or small whatever they want whatever they you know it's proximity plan at least schools.net but it just it just comes to mind um, and you're always more than welcome uh, to give them uh, my personal cell as long as it's reciprocal and I get to give them yours no problem. Thanks, <laughs> and I'll be happy to send that link I'll send Thank that you. link out 
Okay, and Dave. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, um, since we're talking about the messaging aspect of it, I uh, just wanted to, I guess, bring up a concern with a question regarding the culture within the schools themselves, uh, because we've kind of gotten to this uh, culture of uh, competition. Um, I can't speak much in elementary, but you know, I know at high school, I've heard coaches refer to school choices like signing day. Um, in middle school, like Lehigh Middle has a billboard on, uh, on Lee Boulevard right now. So is there going, is there any part of the plan in the works of messaging to the schools themselves to try to get them out of this culture of competing with each other? That is, uh, so we are setting up one-on-ones with a lot of elementary schools, but it's really just informational, like similar to this, you know, getting them caught up with the process. Um, I, you know, I'm confident that working, uh, at, you know, with the leadership teams and with academics and Dr. Spiro and their whole team, uh, that they will be, uh, they will be able to organize the, you know, the proper channels in, in communication as it relates to that. Yeah, I mean, high school and, and middle school is, is just crazy when it comes to the competition. Uh, and, and the cost is just too high. Uh, that's why I love the approach with the elementary schools because there's, there, you know, that does not belong. It really doesn't belong in education, uh, but yeah, it doesn't belong with our little babies. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your comment. And I will definitely, I, I shotted it down and I'll take it to, uh, as we move through this process, keep it in mind that this has to be communicated, um, you know, to our, to our school leaders um, who fight really hard. Our school leaders do fight really hard uh, for their schools and they've done such an amazing job this year. And, you know, it's just changing the, it's just pivoting their approach, you know, from, uh, from competition and, you know, and, and we are the best choice uh, to we are one of many strong choices. And can I just add to that? If you pull up the crabgrass on that question and get it down to its smallest common denominator, it's getting our legislators to understand to stop it from the top. When we, uh, I mean, everything is driven, our, our teachers uh, wanting to be at certain schools, our parents is all, the, the, the uh, competition piece is driven by VAM scores and school grades and all of that. And until we stop it from up here, we can attempt to stop the bleed and hopefully we will, but it, it's still an issue. So that's where you guys come in when you're talking to your legislators to stop making education a competition. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have any additional questions? Okay, so are there any, um, you've, you've heard a lot of information. So you, you may want you know, some time to think about it and maybe this comes back to our next meeting. But it, um, thinking about what you've heard so far tonight, is there anything that you want to make sure um, gets back to the committee that's working on this, that gets to the board in terms of any recommendations or comments from this group? Um, Cindy, maybe, maybe we could share those at the next meeting if people feel like they need to process a lot of this great information that we got tonight. Um, I yes. would still like to leave my suggestion that Adam said has come up before or consistently on the table with regard to the messaging since that was something that was part of this presentation. Um, just because I feel like if some of the Lee County teachers don't understand what a proximity plan is, there's, you know, maybe we need to get that information out to the schools and all the way down to the instructional staff so they can also be able to talk about it um, in an informed way with, with their parents going forward. And, and Absolutely. Adam, that, to me, that, that brings a, um, another suggestion with this. I know you have said previously that people contact you or they contact the site and they give suggestions and their suggestions are used. I think the key to that is showing them and the community that those suggestions, we heard from Susie Q and her question was this. And so here's what we did. And I think what Dr. Stork is getting at, it, you know, people will make suggestions and, and make comments, but when they see they're be actually being used, they're, they're motivated to make more and pass the word on to others to make more comments. 
Thank you, Ms. Giddens. You're absolutely right. Yeah, we're hoping in March, once we have the final boundaries, that we have a map that we can highlight where these comments and what, you know, a certain triaging of the comments and how those boundaries, uh, you know, were moved and changed based on community concerns um, and all the other factors and considerations that would allow us to do it or not allow us to do it. So yeah, we're, that was, that was in the mapping mind, uh, team, you know, like, uh, uh Courtney Gordon and, in in Davis demographics, they want to definitely show how these maps were influenced and changed uh, from public input. And you can also make it like a, a timeline, uh, get people enthused that, you know, okay, we're running out of time to get your suggestion and give them a deadline that we're, we're going to you know, stop taking suggestions here. So we really need, some, type, some people are motivated by last minute. <laughs> and to uh, Michelle's point, you know, it's really important that employees of the district really understand this plan because a lot of times we get questions. You know, you're out in the grocery store and somebody knows you work for the district. They come up and think that you know everything about every single part of the district. But this is big. This, this is going to affect our community. This is something that our employees really do need to understand. And um, I, I know that starts in this office. And we've, we've talked about that uh, even at Cabinet the last couple of times is that we need to make sure that that everybody on cabinet has a really thorough understanding, and that sounds really easy, but it's not because it, it's an ever you know it's it's been uh, it's taken some iterations. There's been some changes made. I mean, this is still a developing plan, and so it's it's kind of hard to wrap your head around it when it's still mid development. But uh, again, to Michelle's point, I think it's really important that people. They, they might see, oh, big five, one of the big five is proximity. And it goes, whoop, I uh, have no idea what that means or why that's important. And it's that's a great point that we need to make sure that everybody in our uh, organization really understands what that means and is able to explain it in simple terms. I definitely so see it, parents reaching out to their child's teacher you know, to say, oh, is, I heard about this. Is my child going to be able to come to the school next year or whatever the conversation is? I, I feel like that would be the, the initial start for a lot of people about the question. So having the instructional staff understand it, I think is really important. Good point. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Adam, thank you again. Really appreciate your time and the depth of understanding that you have of this because you have really been embedded in it from the very beginning. And we appreciate that. So next time we'll come back and after people have had some time to uh, to process and think about, are there any recommendations? Um, uh, Michelle, did you want to make your recommendation an official recommendation this evening? Or do you want to wait until next week? Um, I can wait because I'd rather the committee agreed upon it as a whole rather than just be my recommendation. So if oh, well, the committee yes, would course. like to think about it until the next meeting and then you know, we can talk about if that was a good recommendation or if there's others that we need to add. Unless, you know, it's up to you all. If you think you have some recommendations that we can talk about tonight, we still have some time left in the meeting before, before it ends, we could do that or we could put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Thanks, Adam. Uh, if we could put it on the agenda for the next meeting, I would appreciate, I have a few ideas, just need to put the words to thought or thoughts to that words. That sounds great. Great, thank you. In that case, so thank you, Adam, very much. And you are welcome to stick around for the end of the meeting, or you are also welcome to sign off. Thank you so much. And then I believe um, Ms. Gittens is probably next on the agenda. I'll turn it back to Dr. Stork. Okay, so actually we we're at the, we're a little past the point of public comment, but I don't see anybody extra in our participant list. So then we're moving on to our board member report by Mrs. Gittens. Okay, thank you very much. And um, it's it's been a busy time since I last spoke with you, but I'm trying to kind of condense it. I still very, very strongly recommend that you guys watch some of the meetings yourselves. Um, they are on YouTube and it is under Lee Schools TV and all of the board meetings are there. I will, re you know, remind you that the workshops are the real meaty parts because that's where we talk about things and kind of 
tear it apart and get input from staff and all of that. And the briefings are where we find out about new initiatives and also though get to uh, ask questions and you know get our questions answered. And at briefings, if anyone has um, from the public, there is public comment there. And then our action meetings, of course, there's public comment as well. Um, we talked a lot about um, priorities, prioritizing our workshops and Cindy's an integral part of that. But when we have thoughts and ideas, well, we need to workshop that. We need to get more information on a certain topic. Then we will put it on the list to have a workshop where we can spend more time on that idea. Um, one of the other big deals, the public records request. You've heard about us in the news recently about public records requests. Well, we were in the process anyway of revive, revitalizing and kind of revising that process. And it is going to be automated. It will be on our uh, website. Um, they're looking to have the soft launch is next. And then in March, they will have a full launch of it where you can just go online and put in uh, uh, what it is that you want. They will get back to you and tell you how much it will be. And I believe they're trying to set it up where you can either uh, you know, drop off the, the money for it or you can um, uh, send it mail in a check or something to that effect. So that is a big thing to look for. Um, textbook adoption for ELA, we talked about. It's Black History Month and it's also Career Tech Ed Month. So we had uh, some students and that's what we hope to do in the future when we have um, resolutions and things to read is to have students to be involved and come and do that. Um, there was, we did receive uh, word from DOE that we were over on our class size amendment for I think 10 schools, something to that effect. And in normal circumstances, that would mean that we would have a certain amount of time to get those classes back under the requirement or we would be fined. We actually have until October 1st, I think it is, to get that done. And as of last word, we've already got most of them taken care of. Keep in mind that we need teachers. And as we phase back into face-to-face -face from the, all of the other models, we have this influx of students and not an influx of teachers. So there will be times that that uh, class size amendment requirement and what we have to work with and the lack of teachers is going to cause us to be uh, out of compliance. I remember when they first started this, there was a big discussion and that sometimes based on what's happening, it's cheaper just to go ahead for us and pay the fine for a couple of classes than to go through uh, trying to figure out a way when we don't have the teachers to do it. So we'll, I'll keep you posted about that one. But for right now, we're doing okay. And we have until October to fix it totally. Um, we did talk about and pass the religious expression policy uh, having to do with, uh, you know, students being able to pray. And if you praying and stuff in school that has to be a student or having a religious event uh, with clothing. And it's a whole policy and you can look at it on there. Um, we also had another policy on guest teachers. That's what we call our substitute teachers. And it's a whole policy as to what they can and can't do and et cetera, et cetera. So that went through as well. Um, there was a lot of discussion about a couple of the schools that are uh, being built or on the list to be built. And you can go back and watch that on your own. The main uh, thing that uh, a few of us brought up was the, the process and timing. And that's why I said earlier that the example of proximity 
to me is the way it should be. There's nothing in stone. There's not a brick been laid yet in the proximity plan and everybody is giving input. You know, we're bringing it to you and all of the stakeholders know exactly before we put it in ink and the ink dries, this is what we're going to do. So the board decided too, that we're going to do a workshop and talk about the timing of that process. When do we include all of our, our stakeholders, the public? When do we include the board? When do we get input from uh, you know, town halls or whatever? And my suggestion is that if that's a policy and it's stated out there, then every time the board, I mean, the district says, we're gonna do a new project. Well, all you have to do is go to the website and see, well, at what time am I gonna be able to talk about this? And it's there one, two, three. When they get to step three, then I know I can talk about it. And in the meantime, I bone up on it and read about it and see all that I need so that I'm ready when it's my turn, so to speak, to um, get involved with it. Um, and, and the whole thing is, like I said earlier, the more we keep stakeholders involved, the less issues we have, the less tumultuous board meetings like you're talking about, oh, we've had our share. But the more we let people know ahead of time, this is what we're looking at and here's the option. We're looking at doing this. We could do this right here. Let us know what you think. These are the reasons why we're doing this one. We could do this, but, and just breaking it down simplistically and giving everybody the information. So that is kind of uh, where we're at. Um, if you have any questions about anything, we're, we're out there in the news a lot and uh, <laughs> I'm sure you all know this, but if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or you know, any of the board members so that we can tell you the real skinny on stuff if we can at the time. But I appreciate you and I really enjoy being in, with this group. I told them though at the meeting last night, um, I started saying something about this group and I said, CSI, systemic, uh, 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 <laughs> well, continued in, uh, systemic improvement. And I, I stumbled on it and I said, it's hard enough saying it without a mask. With a mask, it's almost impossible. So I just say CSI. But thank you all so much for what you do and your time and concern and, and uh, interest in what's going on in our schools. Thank you, Mrs. Gittins. Cindy, you're um, on the agenda next for topics for remaining meetings. So I know you have the three that we ranked as well as what Mrs. Gittins shared at the beginning. So I'll let you go ahead and take this. Okay, um, so I, I was planning for next time and realized that I didn't have a plan, so I went back and looked to see uh, what the rankings were. And so I pulled them up. Um, the first one was the whole child, the academic success piece, which we had a presentation, you might remember, from the three curriculum directors, and that was uh, pretty in-depth. Uh, then we had one on social emotional learning of the whole child. And again, a, a very in-depth piece there from Lori Brooks and uh, Marilyn Rodriguez. Uh, then um, the next area that was ranked was tech innovation, student focus. And I, I believe that that was covered pretty well in that first presentation. They looked at how they were integrating the technology and how they were using the um, some of the, the Nearpod program, for example, and uh, the, um, the Home Connect program. So I'm not sure there's a whole lot else there for them you know, to, to get information there. The next one that we have listed is communication of the district strategic plan was the next highest topic. So I wanted to get some clarity around that. And uh, Ms. Gittins, I believe that that was one of the, the things that you had talked about. So if, if you wanna tell us what you're looking for there uh, in terms of what the board needs from this group, and then we can better plan for that for our next meeting. Okay, you mean just in general, the types of things that we're looking for. I'm sorry, well, the, I missed. That's okay, I, I know it's kind of in and out. The, the topic was uh -huh. communication of the district strategic oh. plan. And I'm not sure yes. if it was, you wanted to know how we could better communicate that out or what was that? 
Well, yes, and communication is such a major thing, at least for me, as it's, it kind of is the glue that keeps us all together and everything running. And with some of the advisory boards, they have talked about the communication piece and how good or bad it is or what needs to change. And I would like to know the same thing from you guys. What uh, some of your parents, some of your grandparents, some have had kids go through the the uh, system and have don't have kids there anymore. But you're still, you know, taxpayers and stakeholders in this um, in this process that we're doing. So, I just would like to hear your definition of what you'd like to hear. Excuse me, as well as what you would like the board to know from you. So it's that two-way communication. We have topics each time and you know how what do you what would you want me, for example, to go back and talk about that Adam told us and your thoughts and um, and it may mean an email to me afterwards saying, you know, well please make sure you mention this or ask that. And, and like uh, Amanda was saying, you time to process it all and then feel free to send me an email because we're in between meetings. Usually we meet like right after one and I would have time to get it together and bring it up at the meeting. I want to represent your thoughts. That's the whole idea of advisory boards. Okay, thank you. So for next time then, uh, the two items that I'll do put on the agenda would be um, sort of a recap of tonight's meeting and any comments that you want or recommendations that you would like to go forward to the board. And then I'll work on a protocol to get feedback on communication of the district strategic plan and what you would like to see um, from the board and how you would like to communicate better with the board. Does that make sense? Okay, well, and Cindy, thank you. I'm not sure about timing. Um, I know we don't have another meeting till the 23rd of the board, the 22nd, 23rd. When is our next meeting of this group? And in conjunction with the timeline for what's happening with proximity, I don't want us to miss out on getting your input to them in a timely manner either. Right. Let me look at our next, I believe our meeting is the 10th of March. Yes, our meeting, our next meeting is the 10th of March. And I'll need to check um, with Adam to see what his timetable is. If it turns out we need some comments before then, I can send out an email and ask you to respond not to everybody, but individually, and then can get make sure that those get to Adam or you can provide feedback directly to him with the information. I'll send you the link and his, uh, his email address that he had placed up on the the presentation earlier, and I'll also get that presentation from him and send you that as well. Okay, and maybe copy, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Stork or someone so we can put it out to everybody to say these are the questions from this group. Um, I don't know, just so that we know everything was kind of covered. Maybe some something someone else asked you were thinking about or. Um, yeah, it, yes, if you so send them to me individually, I can points. I can organize them and send and send everybody. It's just um, with sunshine, we're not supposed to send them to each other, but I can send out one composite email once we get information from other people if it turns out that the deadline's before our next meeting. Okay. Okay, Dr. Stork, all yours. You Okay, um, so we have good of the order uh, on the agenda next. Does anybody have anything for the good of the order? It's a quiet group after all that information, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. They're processing. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there was a lot to process there for sure. Okay, so now we are uh, at the point of adjournment. So I need to entertain a motion to adjourn. So move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thanks. We got a first from Dave and a second from Ryan. Uh, all in favor of adjourning tonight's meeting. <laughs> Aye. Wonderful. Thank you for your time tonight, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Appreciate you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.